Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault coming to you again from my backyard. Andrew is off. Tonight, healthcare workers sound the alarm about dwindling supplies. I'm clean with the Ontario Premier, protect the frontline workers. Masks are being rationed at some Ontario hospitals, and there's growing concern not all provinces have enough ventilators if coronavirus cases surge. I don't know if or when I will have surgery. I don't know if I will survive this. Cancer surgeries cancelled. Some prescription drugs in short supply. The side effects of a healthcare system strain. I don't know where the next dollar is coming from. Financial help is coming, but are you eligible for coronavirus benefits? The danger of misleading claims. Sometimes experience is more important than science. The Canadian clinic promising to prevent coronavirus with herbal tea. A CBC News undercover investigation. This is The National. Every day, we are inundated with hard and growing coronavirus numbers. The number of infected in Canada, over 4,000. The number of dead, 39. But tonight, we want to start with a name. Ziyama Rosenberg, a loving grandfather, a Second World War veteran, and a victim of COVID-19. A loss made all the more painful by isolation. Because of the virus, his family wasn't able to say goodbye. Ellen Morrow brings us their story. Ziyama Rosenberg lived for his family, always supportive, <laughs> always laughing. He was always happy and he had such an infectious smile. Rosenberg was born in Ukraine more than 100 years ago. He fought against the Nazis in the Second World War before immigrating to Canada. Here he raised a family now deep in mourning. I wish I could see him one more time. It's hard for everyone because he was such a great guy and he was, he was always there. Rosenberg is one of at least 22 Canadian seniors to have succumbed to COVID-19. For his grandson, it makes the loss all the more heartbreaking. It's so surreal, like when you get the news that your, your relative, my grandfather, tested positive for COVID-19, it's like, it, it's shocking. It's like, how is that even possible? It's not known how Rosenberg contracted the virus. After struggling to breathe at his senior's apartment complex last Friday, he was rushed to hospital and died there five days later. During that time, Rosenberg's family says they weren't allowed to visit as a safety precaution, the virus robbing them of their grandfather and the chance to say goodbye. He was all alone in the hospital, completely isolated. It's very tough, it's very tough. <laughs> A harsh reality eased, if only a little, by precious memories. My grandfather was an amazing man, an honorable man. I want everyone to know what a, what a great grandfather he was to me. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. Behind each patient, each personal story, are healthcare workers working to treat them. But the system itself, already strained, could be inundated in the weeks to come. In Canada's hospitals, stories of critical supplies running low, the kind of gear needed to keep doctors and nurses safe right now. Add to that a scramble to get enough life-saving equipment before a major surge in ICU admissions. And with all the resources being poured into this battle, there are very real consequences for patients waging wars against other illnesses. In some Ontario hospitals, face masks are being rationed right now. As John Lancaster shows us, that has some health workers worried and everyone searching for solutions. We feel like we're disposable. Ontario nurse Pam Park says for more than a week, nurses at her Oshawa hospital didn't have access to crucial protective gear to treat COVID-19 patients. In particular, the N95 mask, which screens out airborne particles. Instead, they were told to use less protective surgical masks. Staff are now getting those N95 masks, but supplies are being monitored and kept under lock and key. I'm pleading with the Ontario Premier to please provide the funding, order these equipments, get them in, and uh, provide it to the hospital and protect the frontline workers. At this Toronto hospital, frontline staff are issued just one surgical mask a day. 
In a memo obtained by CBC News, staff were told it is important that we conserve procedure masks for the duration of this pandemic, which will go on for some time. Ontario has shipped 1 million N95 masks that expired in storage. They're going to hospitals for other uses. Today, Ontario's Minister of Health said this. We are working at procurement 24-7. Uh, Ontario companies are stepping up in great numbers to help us. Ontario says it secured 12 million sets of surgical gloves, a million N95 masks, and nearly 6 million more surgical masks. The federal government is also scrambling to find more protective masks and supplies. They talk about social distancing. So Paul Jansen worked through the 2003 SARS outbreak and saw firsthand the toll on health care workers. They made up almost half of all infections due to the lack of proper protective equipment. Kind of do have a roadmap on how this is going to play out, not just from things like SARS, um, but because it's kind of hit other countries in uh, you know, very drastic ways. The Registered Nurses Association of Ontario says frontline health care workers are at war with COVID-19. Already six nurses have contracted the virus. How is under investigation? John Lancaster, CBC News, Toronto. There is concern too about life-saving equipment for patients if we see a surge in cases in the coming weeks. Already more than three dozen have died and it's infected more than 4,000 people across the country. 634 of those cases are new today, including large jumps in Ontario and Quebec. And other numbers are also coming into focus. Of the cases seen in Canada, the government puts those needing hospitalization at about 6%. Critical cases requiring an ICU bed at 2%. And the fatality rate sits at roughly 1%. The fact that Canada's fatality rate is at 1% indicates that the healthcare system is not currently overwhelmed. But that could rapidly change, and as Karen Pauls explains, the supply of one particular hospital resource will be critical for keeping Canadians alive. A desperate shortage of ventilators in northern Italy means only people under 60 are getting them. The situation is really serious, says this nurse. We could see a shortage in Canada, too, if we see the surge of serious COVID-19 patients expected in the next few weeks. One Toronto-area emergency doctor issued this warning. We can handle many sick patients, but there's a limit. After that, well, I'd rather not say. When CBC News examined the data, we found Ontario has about 12 ventilators per 100,000 people, even considering the extra on order. That's the second lowest provincial ratio just ahead of PEI. Quebec has the highest with 35 per 100,000 people. And when you account for the needs of non-COVID patients in Ontario, the availability drops dramatically. The federal health minister has hinted at a central deployment of equipment and supplies. How we best distribute those to both meet the preparation needs of dis ju various jurisdictions, but also the immediate needs. Yeah. But that's not going over well we, everywhere. We need the equipment that we have in Alberta for Albertans. Companies like this one in Winnipeg are working around the clock to fill orders for ventilators. We're going to really keep close eye on where the real difficult places are in Canada, where, where people are struggling, and that's going to be our priority. But what if there aren't enough ventilators for the patients who need them? Difficult conversations with patients and family. Dr. David Mino says any decision like that would be made by a team. We have to look at who will benefit the most from the resources that we give to the patient. A delicate decision everyone is hoping will never have to be made. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Experts really believe the full impact of COVID-19 hasn't hit hospitals yet, but Christine Birak shows us there are already serious delays in care because of the crisis, especially for patients who don't even have the virus. For surgeons like Jory Simpson and patients who have cancer, these are surreal, almost unthinkable times. My biggest fear would be the collateral damage caused by the pandemic. And the collateral damage is something like cancer care. 
On average, more than 600 Canadians are diagnosed with cancer and over 200 patients die from the disease every single day. I'm angry and I'm scared. Kara Heitman was ready to undergo surgery for breast cancer in three days. She just found out it's being rescheduled. I don't know if I will have surgery. I don't know if or when I will have surgery. I don't know if the cancer will spread. I don't know if it will metastasize. I don't know if I will survive this. Doctors we spoke with said if a patient has, for example, a deadly growing brain tumor, it will be removed. But in the race to make space for COVID-19 patients, there is little to no consistency for treating other cancer patients. I know that is not a comfort to people with cancer that are having their surgeries postponed, but they are, those decisions are being made based in consultations with cancer care experts. Hospitals in Ontario are essentially triaging patients. Priority is given to those with life or limb-threatening cancers. Patients with solid tumors may wait up to four weeks, including breast and colon cancer. And those with early-stage prostate or thyroid cancers may be postponed for two months. We're trying to call as many patients who had appointment as possible and then decide based on the phone call whether the patient needs to be seen in person or not. Hospitals haven't yet been overwhelmed with COVID-19 cases. Until that happens, Heitman feels cancer patients should be treated. That doesn't make sense to me. In these uncertain times, there are no easy answers. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Many other patients are worried about whether they'll be able to get their medications. Pharmacies say they are taking steps to secure Canada's supply, but Vicodopia tells us that means for some, limiting prescriptions. Of all of Bruce Peratt's prescriptions, his blood pressure medication is perhaps most critical. Hypertension puts him at high risk of severe illness if he gets the coronavirus. He has only a month's supply. We're being told to self-isolate. So now, instead of going to Shoppers Drug Mart once every three months, I'm going there once a month. Across the country, pharmacies are limiting medications to a 30-day supply. It's an unprecedented move by regulators, but necessary, according to this research pharmacist. Like there is a concern. Canada's drug supply is linked to a global network of wholesalers, manufacturers and distributors. And the demands for certain drugs that may help with the symptoms of COVID-19, such as asthma inhalers, could put a strain on that supply. My biggest concern with what's happening in the U.S. is if, if it does continue to worsen in the direction that it's currently going, uh, is that Canadians will watch this, uh, and be fearful of what potentially could occur in Canada and start acting in a way that allows them to stockpile. Adding to that pressure, about 80% of the active ingredients in pharmaceuticals are made by just two countries, India and China. Manufacturing is starting to return to normal in China, but India has temporarily banned the export of two dozen active ingredients to protect its own drug supply. I think that the coronavirus outbreak is causing a big wake-up call for us to pay attention to our drug shortages that exist already and to pay attention to where our drugs come from. While there is no national shortage in Canada right now, the federal government has enacted legislation giving it sweeping powers to force patented drug makers to manufacture more medication and, if necessary, take those patents away. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. What's becoming clear is that different provinces and cities are facing different challenges while trying to manage the virus. Anita Bath is tracking stories from communities across Canada for us tonight. Anita? Adrian, let's start in Ontario, where the backlog of testing continues to grow, but the province is promising to expand testing by the end of the week. It has been uh, uh, hindered uh, to some extent by the lack of reagent. We are putting out appeals for reagent across the board. We have some coming in right now, which is great, uh, so that we can increase the, the lab testing capacity. And Premier Doug Ford out with some tough words today for an upscale Toronto grocery store for selling Lysol wipes for $30. I have zero, zero tolerance for price gouging. I'm, I'm calling him out. Uh, Pusa Terry's. That's disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. A company like that would be selling hand wipes for, for that cost. 
The store says the high price was an error. All right, let's move on to Quebec and an appeal to people who are able to volunteer their time to help those in need. OK, but how does that jive with the request to shut down businesses to keep people at home? What I'm asking Quebecers is to please help, if you can, to uh, deliver food to the people that need, that don't have money to buy food. So I think it, there's a difference with a non-essential business for the next three weeks and feeding the population. Quebec is also saying that testing will be stepped up in the west central part of Montreal. That's an area that's seen a big cluster of cases. Back to Toronto. All right, thanks, Anita. There are big developments tonight from Washington. The Trump administration reportedly dropped plans to station American soldiers near the Canadian border. The rationale, apparently, to keep the virus out. Leaders on both sides of the border were asked about that plan today. Well, we have very strong deployments on the southern border, as you know, with Mexico. And we had some troops up in uh, Canada, but I'll find out about that. Canada and the United States have the longest unmilitarized border in the world. Uh, and it is very much in both of our interests for it to remain that way. So that border has been demilitarized for more than 200 years. However, both sides have closed off access to non-essential travel for at least 30 days. Well, tonight, the United States passed a disturbing marker. It now has more COVID-19 cases than any other country in the world. The U.S. now has more than 83,000 cases. That's more than China and Italy. But the number of deaths is lower than in those countries for now. COVID-19 has killed more than 1,200 people in the United States. About half of those cases are in New York. Paul Hunter shows us what the situation is like there. And now a giant makeshift morgue. This one outside a hospital in Manhattan, where the grim expectation is there will soon be more bodies than they can handle. Echoing fears in the New York medical community broadly. Almost any scenario that is realistic will overwhelm the capacity of the current healthcare system. All the feet that you see, they all have COVID. More sobering evidence, it's already overwhelming. This video sent to the New York Times by an emergency room doctor at New York's Elmhurst Hospital. Leaders in various offices, from the president to the head of health and hospitals, saying things like, we're gonna be fine. And from our perspective, everything is not fine. Five she describes shortages of ventilators and masks. Refrigerated truck. And yes, a refrigerated truck ready for bodies. Who are dying. Today, outside that same hospital, long lineups to get in. Meanwhile, the latest growing hotspot, New Orleans, where last month, more than a million revelers squeezed together for Mardi Gras. Now, with the highest corona deaths per capita in America, it's a changed city. The streets are empty. The French market is empty. It's rather surreal, actually. At his home in the New Orleans suburbs, Joseph Dunn told us he himself was out on those streets last month. That's him on the right, as he now worries what's to come in Louisiana. I wouldn't say that people are freaking out. I'd say that they're, they're paying attention. As this ramps up and as our, um, especially in our rural areas, our healthcare systems or our hospitals are not able to deal with it. With that challenge and fear growing, Donald Trump, meanwhile, continues to consider relaxing guidelines on social distancing, though today underlined that for the moment. For a while, stay home. Just relax, stay home. Making a lot of progress. Highlighting as well continuing work on therapies and vaccines, even though both are likely some time away. As Trump put it, I hope we get lucky. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Thousands of Canadians are trying to figure out if they're eligible for Ottawa's emergency relief money. It becomes this calculated game of do I do nothing or do I, you know, work? Next on The National, answering your questions about who gets money and how and when. Plus, we answer your questions about COVID-19, like should we stop using reusable grocery bags? 
And remember the original work from home family? And I think one of your children's just walked in. As we all figure out that work from home life balance, they're back with some kind of encouraging words. We're back in tune. COVID-19 has hit livelihoods blindingly fast and the federal government expects 4 million Canadians to tap into the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. That's a monthly payment to cover a sudden loss of income. But like so much right now, it's new and Canadians have questions. Ashley Burke has some answers. Please get to the front. This is how Catherine Mazarak has been paying for her university education. But the dance studio is now closed. It's a little stressful, just mostly because of the unknown. We launched the new Canada Emergency Response Benefit, which will provide $2,000 a month for up to four months to people who are not getting paid as a result of COVID-19. It sounds good, but many Canadians have the same question. Am I eligible? Every Canadian that finds themselves in a situation where they've, they've earned revenue in the past 12 months of $5,000 or more, and they don't have any income as a result of COVID-19, they can get this benefit. That's key here. You have to earn no income at all for 14 days, meaning self-employed people like Maserac aren't eligible if they have some money coming in. It becomes this calculated game of do I do nothing or do I, you know, work? The calculation is a little different for the million Canadians who applied for EI last week alone. So what about people who are already getting EI? EI-eligible Canadians who have lost their jobs can continue to apply for EI online and will be automatically enrolled in the CERB. If you've already applied for EI, you're covered. If you haven't applied yet, the government says wait until it launches its online application in early April. That leads to the next big question. How soon will I get the emergency benefit? People should start receiving money within 14 days of applying. That's at least mid-April. Not soon enough for this yoga teacher. He's unsure how he's going to pay next month's bills. I don't know where the next dollar is coming from in terms of my teaching, and I'm a little nervous about that, and just the wait time for that to come through is highly distressing. Patience a struggle when both time and money are running out. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Still ahead on The National, what are you supposed to do if you see someone breaking social distancing rules? You have reached the COVID compliance tip line. Is it snitching or is it social responsibility? Plus, are doctors your questions? Like, is it possible to catch COVID-19 again after you've recovered? Welcome back. As the outbreak grows, the amount of information can be overwhelming. So every night, we're committing time on this program to answering your questions. With me tonight, Dr. Lenora Saxinger, Infectious Disease Specialist at the University of Alberta, and Dr. Isaac Bogosh, Infectious Disease Specialist at the University Health Network in Toronto. So let's get right into it here. Since the virus's impact is mainly on the lungs, causing pneumonia, does it mean that seniors who've had a pneumonia shot will have a measure of protection from the virus? Uh, we'll give this to both of you. Let's start with you, Dr. Bogosh. Yeah, so, I mean, certainly we know that seniors are supposed to get this pneumonia vaccine, but this vaccine itself will not protect them from getting this COVID-19 infection. It will help, however, if someone has a co-infection, meaning they get a bacterial pneumonia on top of it. This could protect against bacterial pneumonias that may be superimposed, but it will not protect against the COVID-19 infection. I would just Dr. add Saxinger? that... Um, so far, there's really no evidence that there's a particular pattern of co-infections in COVID-related disease and what types of bacteria are the most common causes of those. But I completely agree that this is a reasonable step and really should be done for seniors anyway. Okay, Dr. Saxon, your next one for you. Should we avoid using reusable grocery bags during the COVID-19 outbreak? 
grocery bags have people upset. And I think part of it is because there was a study suggesting that the virus is still viable on plastic after about 72 hours. But I think people should pay attention to what they are doing with their belongings and where they've been before assuming that things carry risk. And um, I think that your options would be a reusable bag that you can wash frequently or a single-use bag that you can dispose of, which of course is environmentally less friendly. And finally, anything that you carry that might have virus contamination, you can get rid of your risk by washing your hands thoroughly after you touch things, so upon coming home from shopping. So the simplest thing is managing your hand hygiene and thinking about the places you've been. It always comes back to washing your hands. Dr. Bogosh, if someone has recovered from COVID-19, is it possible to get it a second time? The short answer of that is that we don't entirely know now, but most people believe that if you've been infected with this virus, uh, it's very unlikely that you're going to get reinfected with this virus during the course of this pandemic. That may change with time. Of course, we're still open to this possibility, but there doesn't seem to be much evidence for people to be reinfected after they've been infected with this virus. So I think people will likely have immunity for the course of this pandemic. Okay, so one more question uh, just to toss your way here. Let's have a look here. What are you looking for in terms of how our public health system navigates the next stage of this pandemic? And we'll just do this with you, Dr. Saxon here. I think that, I mean, so far, I think the public health response has been appropriate and measured. And what we're going to be looking for is continued stewardship of the things the community has to do to protect us. And we're going to be looking more into uh, the health system response as well as cases increase in the community. Um, I think I would like to see standardized reporting across provinces for better data handling as well. All right, both of you, once again, thank you very, very much. We get great questions every day and great answers from you every night. So as we've okay. mentioned, uh, we will be asking your questions about COVID-19 every night going forward. So send us the questions you have. You can message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National, or you can send us an email at covid at cbc.ca. Just put The National in the subject line. So the message from leaders across the country has been very clear. Disobeying quarantines and social distancing measures puts lives in danger and in some cases comes with penalties. So when you witness a failure to comply, do you snitch? As Chris Glover explains, some definitely are. Parks locked up, but in Toronto, they've been the scene of social distancing fails, leading to dozens of complaints. We just heard a little bit more music and because my boyfriend and I are in the middle of a move, we happen to be outside. In Revelstoke, BC, Zoe Purvis was shocked to see a party across the street and called the RCMP non-emergency line to report it. Played a little bit on my heartstring just because I'm being so cautious. They either don't know or they just really don't care. You have reached the COVID compliance tip line. Some jurisdictions ask you to report by phone. In others, like Newfoundland and Alberta, it's an online report. Do not call 911 unless there is an emergency that requires a response by police, fire or paramedics. Now we're going to wear gloves. Paramedics stand ready to respond to suspected COVID cases, but BC officials say some are exaggerating symptoms to get attention. We can't be tying up uh, uh, resources and, and supplies unnecessarily. Um, especially in this heightened uh, situation. Many 911 calls are non-emergencies. We cannot answer questions about COVID-19 um, and we absolutely cannot be taking complaints about long grocery store lines. Yeah, that's what people like me are for. <laughs> there you go, exactly. <laughs> Some are confused about how to report so-called covid -iots. At the tone, please make your report. Others creating joke videos of the snitch mentality, but Zoe Purvis says thinking must change. I don't think it really is a snitch scenario. We're all doing it to protect someone that we know that we love. It's working. This park in Windsor, Ontario today nearly empty. Yesterday, it was swarming with crowds. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead on the national debunking dangerous claims that tea can prevent you from catching COVID. Spoiler alert, it can't. But first, Rosie's here with the at issue gang. Adrian, the Prime Minister has continued to speak to Canadians every day this week. There's a lot to unpack, a shift in tone, tougher restrictions, and help for those who need it most. But is it working? Chantal, Andrew, and Althea will join me right after this break.
enough is enough. Go home and stay home. If people do not follow these guidelines, we will put much more stringent measures in place. If you do not comply with these instructions, you could face serious fines and even prison time. So a clear mark, a change, a shift in tone from the prime minister this week as the number of cases in this country continues to rise and the restrictions tighten. So is the government's message reaching Canadians? Is it, is it, are they doing what they're supposed to do? It's Thursday. I'm here with that issue. They are doing their part and staying home. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. And Althea Raj is in Ottawa. Good to see you all. Appreciate you uh, doing this via remotely. Uh, let's start with some of the, those strong words we heard from the prime minister this week. Week, a real escalation uh, in in tone from the prime minister. Uh, Chantal, what did you make of it? Did it did it come at the right time? Yes, because uh, part of the issue is uh, getting public opinion ramped up to accept those messages. So, at this point, I think a lot of uh, Canadians were ready for that tone. To uh, I don't know about Toronto and Ottawa, but in Montreal, it looks to me. Uh, like a lot of people are actually doing what they're supposed to do. The city is virtually empty. But three, uh, there have been nice things uh, and a lot of, I think, well-deserved credit given to premiers like Francois Legault, who has been talking uh, fairly sternly about things like that for a while. Mm -hmm. So I think the Mr. Nice Guy thing uh, in Ottawa uh, was not necessarily the best approach at this point. And it, and it came, Andrew, sort of about a day before the government decided that the Quarantine Act would be used and people coming back into this country would now face this mandatory uh, isolation. Did those things all have to sort of happen, as Chantal points out, to get to that place? I'm not sure. I think the government bears some of the responsibility for whatever backsliding or lackadaisical attitude some Canadians may be taking to this. This is the government that for a long time was saying the risk was low that they didn't need to enforce uh, controls at the borders, for example, that when they did, didn't send people out to, they didn't, didn't have um, proper advisories at, when people for incoming flights. Mm -hmm. So they've now decided to get serious about it. They've now decided to slam on the brakes. They now want to look very tough on this. That's all well and good. But I think, as I say, they, they, they may be overreacting slightly now because they were underreacting before. Althea, what do you think? I think it's too early to say if they're actually overreacting because we haven't seen anything with regards to enforcement. And on the enforcement for a lot of the measures that they have announced in the past, uh, it just wasn't there. You know, when they said there were going to be uh, stricter border controls, when you went through the airport, actually, like nobody asked you anything. And it was like, then a few days later, it was like just a form on the terminal where you like accept that you have read it and that, uh, you know, you know that the government wants you to self isolate. Um, I agree with Charles that it took some time to get public to buy into the idea of a forced quarantine. That being said, um, it seems like the government's messaging doesn't necessarily match what its policy prescriptions are. You know, we had Christia Freeland this week come out and say, and actually the prime minister this morning as well, said this is going to make Canadians feel a lot safer. Well, if you think this was going to make Canadians feel a lot safer, why didn't you do this a week ago or two mm -hmm. weeks ago? Now we're hearing from public health officials that... Most people are getting COVID-19 through community transfers, not through travel. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to, you know, stay, safeguard us from the travelers, you should have acted sooner. Well, well, speaking of the, the messaging, and some of it has been, uh, I would say it's particularly around the Quarantine Act, a little bit confusing and unclear. But there have also been what some people are characterizing as missteps. And, and I'm talking there about, of course, the legislation where the government, according to the Conservatives anyway, overreached. Was that, uh, were they able to salvage things enough that that won't be something that will be remembered as a mistake, Chantal? I suspect that uh, with people losing their jobs uh, in huge numbers every day with the uh, kids not going to school what happened on parliament hill this week is not going to stick for very long i'm not saying that that's a great thing sure. and i do believe in the end that parliament worked this week mm -hmm. but uh you need to um hive off what happens in parliament with what happens on the street and in real life and i believe at the end of the day every politician in this country is going to be judged on uh, where we end up and where we go from there and not what happened uh, in Parliament this week. That, that's, that's fair, but it did become a moment, Andrew, where sort of the collaboration uh, was on pause and, and the politics was very apparent. 
it was a disgraceful uh, overreach. Uh, everybody is un under, uh, understands that we're in extraordinary times and extraordinary measures are needed. I think the opposition parties themselves have signed on to that. People were prepared to give the government a great deal of leeway. But to assert an unlimited power to tax, spend, and borrow for up to two years. And in addition, there were clauses in there that allowed the Minister of Employment to basically rewrite the Employment Insurance Act on the fly. These kinds of things are so far beyond any notion of parliamentary government. They're completely unnecessary. One has the feeling that the government's on opportunity to basically insulate itself in a minority parliament from uh, effective scrutiny for two years uh, and took it. And if the opposition hadn't stood up to it, I think that would have been bad not only for parliament, but bad for fighting this virus. We have to keep all the public on board, not just the people who support the government, but the people who are very skeptical of this government. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if we don't have an effective parliament uh, scrutinizing them and giving voice to people's concerns about the way the government's handling this, then we're not going to be able to have that kind of democratic buy-in that we need. Althea, and I can see Chantal wants to say one more thing. Althea? Uh, it was a colossal mistake. I don't actually believe that the Liberals were trying to uh, safeguard the minority government for two years. I think not enough people saw this piece of legislation. And uh, some people thought they were being a little clever and thought, like, oh, we, we can use, uh, we don't know when this is going to end. Let's give yeah. ourselves as much padding as possible. I think it was gross incompetence, frankly, uh, and embarrassing. And it will go down in the history books as yet another example of the Liberal government um, trying to uh, deny the official opposition its role. I mean, we saw that with Motion 6 a few years ago. Um, so this isn't the first time that the Liberals have tried to um, shortchange Parliament. But they were on such a good, positive course. You know, they were sending a government plane to pick up the leader mm -hmm, of the mm -hmm. official opposition and bring in everybody basically in Ottawa to sing Kumbaya. And we had, Sean, that was right. We saw Parliament actually work well. Well, the opposition um, leaked the content of the legislation. There was public outrage. The government scaled back. The NDP was able to say that they um, also influenced the government by having this $2,000 a month um, flat payment as opposed to going through the EI system, which is some uh, a modified version of what the NDP uh, had been proposing. And then we saw one like the influence that one single member of parliament can have, and that's Conservative MP Scott Reid, who uh -huh. heard about this overreach, uh, the government giving itself powers until 2021 deciding this was outrageous, was not going to give unanimous consent, drove to Ottawa. I mean, his writing's not too far from Parliament Hill. Um, no. And then basically got, I mean, he convinced his own party to backtrack against a unanimous consent that they had given the Liberals two weeks ago. And so there is going to be more Parliament scrutiny on how the Liberals spend money because of that one MP, Scott Reid. Okay, last point to you, Chantal. Okay, one, uh, the saving grace for the government is that it happened over a one-day news cycle, yeah. which uh, there, no one could afford, including the government, a, a parliamentary crisis uh, that stretched beyond that one day. But I, I'm guessing the more disquieting thing is if you don't believe that someone sat in a room and thought, oh, we're going to get control of parliament for two years, which I happen not to believe, it's more disquieting to worry that it's incompetence. I am slash panic uh, at work, and that is worrisome. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got to leave it there. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast for extra content on how the government is managing this crisis. Those questions, important as it goes on. So look for it on any major podcast app and our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. For now, though, it's back to my friend Adrian in Toronto. The moment is coming up, one for the baseball fans missing today's postponed home opener. But first, debunking COVID scams. Next on The National, our hidden camera investigation into a man selling tea, he says, will stave off the virus. We're right back after this. Welcome back. We all know Canadians are feeling a lot of fear right now about contracting this coronavirus, and that could make them vulnerable to claims of fake cures or prevention products. A CBC News hidden camera investigation shows us a Winnipeg acupuncturist was selling a tea he claimed could keep you safe. Caroline Bargut took that to the experts. Last week, a Winnipeg acupuncture clinic sent a mass email to patients it said, COVID-19 is here, so is an herbal tea to prevent it. Using a hidden camera, CBC News posed as a customer to investigate. Sometimes experience is more important than science. 
Acupuncturist Go Jian Huang says the tea's formula was developed by doctors who traveled to Wuhan, China at the start of the outbreak. He claims they drank it prior to arriving and never got sick, even though they stayed there treating patients for a month. Huang charged us $60 for six bags of tea and told us we'd need to drink one a day for the next six days, just like the doctors who went to Wuhan. A University of Manitoba virologist says there are no cures or vaccines for COVID-19, and the medical community needs to do a better job getting that message out. I'm relatively disgusted that we're, you know, we're still trying to profiteer, um, you know, when there are global health crises. Um, but uh, ultimately not surprised. Dr. Peter Lin has heard all kinds of claims since the COVID-19 outbreak, from standing on your head to drinking warm water every 20 minutes to wash COVID away. He says none of them are true. And our biggest concern is that let's say you believe that, you know, drinking warm water or the tea will protect you, then you won't do the right things and therefore you expose yourself uh, in terms of the virus itself. Health Canada has not approved any product to prevent, treat or cure COVID-19 and says making false or misleading claims is illegal. Huang has since walked back his comments and now says the tea can't replace things like social distancing, hand washing or wearing a mask. The Chinese Medicine and Acupuncture Association of Canada has sent him a letter warning him to stop making false claims or risk legal action. Caroline Bargood, CBC News, Winnipeg. Next on The National, a moment for unhappy baseball fans. Instead of hosting the Blue Jays' home opener, Jamie Campbell spent the day calling fans to talk baseball. We listen in next. But first, rewind to 2017. There was no COVID-19. Gathering in groups was still okay. And this gave us all a good laugh. Uh, and what will it mean for... Uh... For the wider region, I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, Professor Robert Kelly became a star when his kids stormed his live BBC interview. The, um, pardon me. Pardon me. My apologies. The trials of working from home on full display with so many more parents now living that life, the BBC decided to bring the family back. Yeah, good to see you excited about being on telly. That's uh, <laughs> not the first time. His kids just as rambunctious, his work life just as wild. Difficult. I get maybe two hours of work done a day, maybe three with this. We're fighting with them all the time. they got something to do. They're climbing the walls. So if this is what your workday looks like, no, you're not alone. I mean, South Koreans have actually really... Up the middle, diving stop, Harrison, long throw, not in time, and that'll be a base hit for Hernandez. Wow, well, those are sights and sounds baseball fans are missing today. These are pictures of last year's home opener at the Rogers Center. So this year's home opener delayed, of course, because of the coronavirus. So what does a sportscaster to, what's a sportscaster to do when there are no sports? Well, witness Jamie Campbell, the host for Blue Jays Baseball on Sportsnet, feeding the baseball fix by calling fans. That's tonight's moment. Oh, hey, Ann, this is Jamie Campbell from Sportsnet. Hi. How are you? Oh, not too bad. Good. How can I reach out to Blue Jays fans when everybody's isolated, and especially Blue Jays fans who are, say, over 65, scared, lonely, not in physical contact with their own family members because of this virus. How are you doing otherwise? Are you uh, getting enough supplies and food? I was just putting some groceries away now that my son bought and got for me. That's great. Most of the phone conversations I have had have had nothing to do with baseball. They revolve around family. And Catherine tells me you have beat cancer twice. Yes. That's remarkable, Anne. I've talked to Vietnam draft dodgers. I've talked to a woman who made it through the Great Depression. I have spoken with kids who are hospitalized. Thanks for the call. Okay, Linda, nice to speak with you. Yes, bye-bye. Bye. I'm completely enriched by this experience. Sweet. So Jamie says that for the past week he has uh, been accepting invitations on social media to, to call up fans. He's had over 2,000 requests. He's made nearly 200 calls. What a strange time. What a great Canadian. That is a national for Thursday, March 26th. Good night. <laughs>